question? Yes. It, it's not a question. It's, it's just a comment. Uh, acupuncture um, has been proved out scientifically. In fact, my brother did the research at the University of California uh, showing PET scans and how uh, there is a uh, all the different neurological limbic system, all the different systems in the brain and the different neurohormones and neurotransmitters that are being given off and what they're doing. So, and he's doing well with Qigong right now. So I think what, what my comment to relate is that, that to meridians in the body from, yes. the, from the brain structure? Yes, to well, they're, they actually put the needle into the meridian the and then you know, this lights up over medicine. here, showing a certain amount of neurotransmitter being given off doing a certain thing. But what I'm trying to say, my comment here is basically that the, a lot of this therapy or, or way of doing medicine has been going on for thousands and thousands of years. And as in Western medicine, we're always looking for proof, some sort of proof some for, to make it valid. And you know, a lot of the cases that these practitioners are getting, some of the worst cases, these are all the people that are, you know, it's not working anywhere else. And they're getting results out of the hardest cases. That's, mm -hmm. I just wanted to comment on That's that. That's a good point. You're getting the hardest cases. You're the last yeah. resort. You're, Ed, you're, the other thing is that you, when you're treating these people and they come to you as a last resort, is that they are in a very debilitated condition. So they're taking worst case scenarios and trying to rebuild a health system. Yeah. Uh, and, and they are getting success where Western medicine has made absolutely no dent. But if they could have started all, much and, earlier. But beyond that, but beyond that, they have actually worsened the condition, not improved. Guy in the red uh, has a question. Uh, I've recently heard instead of acupuncture, in, instead of putting the needles, you can stimulate those meridians by using a cold laser. Do you have any experience in that? Um, not a lot. I know. I know some practitioners do. Do you? I think never said using a laser. Using the laser. laser. Uh, I don't use that either. Uh, yeah, there's the laser do. acupuncture. Instead of needles. Yes, the, uh, that's a new thing. It's a type of energy. Like right. uh, light is a type of energy. Western medicine uses heat as a type mm -hmm. of healing. They use cold as a type of healing. They use sound, ultrasound as a type of healing. A laser is just a different type of energy. It's a light beam. I don't use it. I, I use the needles instead. And I have a question regarding lungs. Have you had any experience with improvement of uh, lung conditions, reduction of mucus interiorly? Uh, yes, um, depending on, on the condition, I would, if, if it's fairly long-term chronic, I may suggest to the person that they do Chinese herbal medicine along with the acupuncture. So, um, but I, I've seen people, I've, I've treated a fair amount of respiratory issues from asthma and bronchitis to uh, um, some of the, the chronic obstructive uh, pulmonary diseases. Um, so, some, as we get, as we talk and get about the long term chronic, it depends on the level of severity that when, when a person first comes in. Um, and again, that gets back to the discussion about, you know, if we, if we could get to a person way before that would be the better. But Chinese medicine acupuncture can, uh, I've seen, work with some of these lung problems. Also, what is the experience with children in uh, acupuncture? Oh, that's not correct. What's my experience? Yes. Uh, my experience is that children are open to it depending on their age. Between, uh, as infants, babies up to one or two years old, you can needle them no problem. Uh, you just have to, you can't retain needles, you have to uh, work with them and, and hold them. You only use a couple of points. For older children, I use, uh, I have tuning forks that I put down on points, I use electrical stimulation, and uh, kids can take herbs. I use herbs with children a lot because I use liquid tinctures because they're not going to swallow anything or do teas, but you put a little tincture and uh, kids respond really well because their systems are pure. They don't have 10, 20, 30 plus years of pollution going on. So most of the stuff I've seen for children are, are kind of more respiratory stuff, ear infections. I had one girl come to me, she was 10 years old, she was about to have her tonsils removed. Three treatments, she let me needle her, I needled right into her tonsils, it brought white blood cells right to that area. Only three treatments, they were better, she didn't have to have her tonsils removed, so. Kids can be great, I, it, it's a small portion of my practice because most people don't think of it. Yeah. But, and, I, would and, think, I would think that most parents would be somewhat reticent yeah. about bringing a child 
to, to do that type of treatment. Yeah, just this morning, I was working this morning, and, and I had a nine-year-old girl who sees me regularly for, um, she has irritable bowel and colitis, and the reason they started acupuncture was they were dealing with it not very well for a few years, and they went to Boston Children's Hospital, where they um, were recommended to have acupuncture, so that's how they came. And she was telling me she's getting a little pressure. She, the girl's doing well now, starting to do well, but they just saw her, um, um, the pediatrician, get the specialist at Albany Med, who's highly suggesting she goes on amitriptyline, and she said, oh, I, she's coming for acupuncture, and, and she said the physician who's like one of the top people at Albany Med, I, I wouldn't know the name, um, said, oh, I've never heard acupuncture being used for IBS. So there's a lot of, um, you know, that, that's hard to believe, but um, so there's a lot of education just from that that still needs to be done. Yeah, and then um, uh, as a uh, physician who's going to soon be a panelist, uh, I'd like to make a comment on what I'm experiencing in Albany as a uh, complementary alternative medical practitioner, amongst other things. One of the things that I find, and I'm interested to see if you see this in your practices, is that we don't have enough communication between traditional physicians and CAM practitioners. Many traditional physicians uh, have no idea, in fact, that their patients are even seeing uh, an acupuncturist, for example, because the patients oftentimes are afraid to tell their traditional physician about it for fear that they're going to be poo-pooed and um, you know, ridiculed and the like. And then the issue on the other side of the coin is if you're doing this, if you're doing CAM, if you're doing acupuncture, or I do um, nutritional and herbal medicine as well, we need to be looking at everything that the traditional physician is doing because we have to look for the kinds of interactions between the care we're going to provide and the effects of drug therapy in these patients. And in some instances, especially with herbal therapy, there can be some very significant interactions. Mm -hmm. And it ends up in our, I think it ends up in our lab to know about these things and make sure that no serious negative interactions occur. Uh, I'd like some of your comments on that. <laughs> Greg, you started. I opened a can of worms, I think. I see. Good. I, I think I've only had one patient that told their doctor they were going to do acupuncture and the doctor said no and I can't remember what that was for. Every patient I think that has told their doctor they say go ahead it can't hurt is their attitude. Um, is there communication? I usually will send a letter for, for some doctors depending on what they're coming for but most my patients the doctors don't know what to do anymore so, so they're, they're saying go ahead do it. You know it's like knee sur surgery or they've had a knee replacement they're still in pain for me to do acupuncture, um, I'm, I'm not using herbs for something like that. Um, as far as interactions, hmm, how do I say it? I'm not afraid of anything I do with any of my patients. We went to the same school. We, we were fully trained in physical exam and in, in drug herb interactions. I just took a continuing education course on alternatives to herbs and drug herb interactions. So I try to stay on top of that as much as I can. You take a drug I, history of every patient off the top to look at what they're taking from I do an hour long history for every patient and I look, if I don't know the drug they're on, I look it up. I have patients come to me, I've found that the, the drugs they're taking are giving side effects and their doctors don't even do I say go back to your doctor and talk about it. But um, I, I'm more concerned with patients coming in on 10 to 15 medications and that's something, my understanding, the MMA says that you're not supposed to be on that many medications, that four is the, 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 the optimal amount. You know, so if somebody's on medication like that, I don't even use herbs, right? If somebody comes in like that, senior citizen on multiple things, I don't even take a risk. So I try to stay within my comfort parameters and I try not to go past that. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, and like Greg, most of my patients are telling their doctors I, I want them to, and they're usually getting um, positive feedback, or at least open-minded feedback. It's rare when someone is told, oh, don't do that. But, but the communication, I think, would be a great thing. Um, I know some, some of my patients have, have taken my cards to give to their doctors, and one or a few times we've talked, I've talked to the doctor on the phone, but I think just I don't know if it's logistics, busyness, um, the ability to actually talk um, would, would be a great thing. I mean, especially when patients are being shared um, and, and there's no threat on, on one end of it. But sometimes there's you know, a little bit of a, a threatened aspect or, or maybe it's just unknown 
But, Speaking yeah. of threats, though, how big is the threat of uh, herbal interaction with some medication being given? I mean, that, that was one of the questions. Is that usually I my herbal? patients bring if they buy from GNCs or somewhere, they usually bring the bottles because. We always ask, what else are you taking or else you're doing? And I have a lot of patients who go to chiropractor, acupuncture, hypnosis. Or if they buy something, they would bring it. Like some patients, they advertise for cholesterol drugs. And they want to go off the cholesterol drug they are taking. And I'm open to it. I let them try it. Or I, and I always make a note of it, what they are doing. And I try to look up that particular drug if I'm not familiar with it, so that I don't see drug interactions. Mm -hmm. So far, I've been lucky, and I haven't seen any. No, you've been skillful. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I almost never see them either. So I've had one or two, or maybe they've had diarrhea, or maybe their blood pressure went up, and we just stop. My concern, though, is, as Andrew noted at the beginning, we have so many new drugs coming out almost weekly. How do you stay on top of what's a potential uh, lethal interaction and what isn't? especially with the herbs you're giving them, which may be unknown. There is a physician's desk reference for herbs, yes. and I believe it comes out yearly. Oh, yes. So that, that's one really helpful tool. There is a we reference. all get it. Yeah. Okay. yeah, so you can look up herb, herb possible side effects, and so on. I, I, my concern is if I'm seeing someone who, who is taking many drugs, it just, just like Greg was saying, I, I wouldn't give them any herbs just because I'm concerned about I mean, you got to be concerned about drug-drug interaction when a person's taking that many Herb drugs. Yeah. But um, yeah, it just it gets me a little nervous just to even think of introducing something, even if it's natural, when when so many drugs are being taken. I just wondered um, what the response of the MD segment of our medical profession is to, especially like the herbal medicines and other alternatives. I think chiropractic and even uh, acupuncture are a little more generally at least tolerated, but um, I just wonder if some of the medical doctors or if a large number of medical doctors are threatened by alternatives. I heard the other day of an alternative medicine uh, conference that had to be canceled because they couldn't get the doctors there. I'm open for it and I do believe in it. And Ayurvedic medicine, we do a lot of ancillary activities, what we just discussed. So I'm open for it. I don't feel whatever makes the patient better should be the goal because every healer or physician, whatever branch they are, the basic motto is do no harm. So we are helping the patient. I think she was wondering though whether there's sort of a hierarchy in, in established physicians view that Maybe acupuncture is okay, but herbal isn't. I mean, do they list? I think it is more boils down to ego, in ego. my way of thinking. That's what I Not find respecting out. the other branches of medicine. I find the uh, doctors are, are completely open to acupuncture, but if their uh, patient goes back and asks, I say, I want you to ask your doctor about the herbs, the doctor's going to say no, because they don't know anything about the herbs, and they don't put any real effort into learning about it. And, you know, the question about talking to them and communicating them, I don't think most of them really have the time or the desire to, to com communicate. I mean, they're just too busy. Not that yeah. they wouldn't. Yeah. It's just too busy to fit that in. Yeah, and okay. I, think, I think in too many cases, the AMA as an organization, which is the nationwide organization for doctors, has a general attitude about any of these therapies in that they're not proven, and that's... We, it's like junk science. It, it was done on just a recent interview on uh, the Today Show when Gary Trudeau was interviewed. Now, Gary may be somewhat of a charlatan, but many of the things that he has got in his book are therapies that have come out of cultures that are 2,000 years old and have proven effective. And yet, the attitude, the general attitude of the organization is that it's junk science. With data, you haven't got any double-blind studies that you can point to, and it's all anecdotal, which means it's experiential, and you can't prove the numbers to me. So they, 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 a goodly number of these men and women, I assume, just reject that out of hand. You know, some of it maybe can, uh, there's no study on this, I, I have no defense in case of malpractice suit. 
Um, I mean, a lot of it is defensive. They don't want to do something that they can't show studies. And, and but, here, Your Honor, this but the is the irony. The irony is that a good share of the information that they're getting for the drugs that they're dispensing is coming from the very drug companies that are exactly. providing the drugs. Yep. And it's in many cases, like the Vioxx case, they knew before they even put that drug on the market that there were issues and they were swept under the rug and it was considered collateral damage. We expect there are gonna be some deaths because people use this, but the greater majority of people were supposed to be helped. Not the case. There are people now though who want Vioxx back on the market. Oh yes. Many indeed. people do indeed. for. Right. right. And, that, and that's why they're going to the black label, like the cigarette pack. It's a great drug for pain. But what I wanted to point out is that for last few years, the double blind studies have stopped because you cannot give placebo to the patient because of the malpractice suit. Yeah. So we, AMA doesn't sponsor any double blind studies. It, what, what about FDA? Have they stopped no, also? No, everything is stopped. Everything is stopped. Yes. I don't think the FDA has looked at herbs, have they? No, but no. there is a movement going on. Andrew Wells is one of them. They he wants to develop a new section in FDA where they can standardize the vitamins, herbs, and all the chem medicine. It's right. They don't even look at vitamins, do they? No. Well, they, they tried to look at it in Europe. As a matter of fact, the European Union tried to regulate vitamins. And there was a, a group that came to uh, defend the use of the vitamins, and specifically in mega dosing, in the fact that they wanted to turn the vitamins in the European Union into prescription drugs. And, that, and the problem with that is the fact that as a member of the World Trade Organization, which the United States is, is that if you are a member of the World Trade Organization, you are supposed to mirror the decisions of the members, the member organizations, and the European Union and the United States are of equal partners. So what that generally means is the fact that we have the European Union all of a sudden trying to manage the vitamins and the herbs that we're going to be using here in the United States. Now what happened out of that is the fact that they got it minimized to some degree but they did not get it eliminated. Hmm. Of course, there's still price fixing on the most prescriptions well, in well, Europe. But, but this is not price fixing. No, I know, yeah. but I mean, it's yeah. a whole different, whole different world. Exactly, I mean, just look at the people trying to go to Canada to get drugs that are one third, one fifth the cost. Because and of price fixing. Yeah, because of marketing costs. They're, they're spending yeah, I mean, so much Canadian. money on marketing to get the drug in the people's hands that it's driving the course up astronomically over the drug itself. The problem is now, though, if more people keep going to Canada, as you know, the drug companies in America are now scaling back from selling to Canada to prevent that from exactly. happening. Exactly, and, and the drug companies themselves. Yeah, well, they have, they're going to. And that... It's interesting to know that the drug companies spend about 14% of their profits on advertising and 8% on research and development. And our drug companies are trying to gain control of vitamins and uh, minerals now so that they can set the prices that because they have free reign in setting prices on other drugs there are also I am on a therapy that has worked for many people that is illegal in our country and it's illegal in this country because the drug companies couldn't figure out how to make it uh, synthetically and therefore to control the price well listen I am so far behind schedule that we're all going to be here at nine o'clock tonight if um, I don't move on toward nutrition. So, panelists, thank you very much. You. It's been very interesting. This panel is uh, dealing with nutrition. Obviously, a few things can be more important to our physical well-being than nutrition. I don't have information on two of the panelists, so Harold Qualters, tell me about yourself. Well, at the present time, I am the uh, executive director of the uh, New York State Restaurant Association's Education Foundation. I am a former owner of Qualtrics Restaurant in uh, Auburn, New York. And before that, I was a high school educator. And that's my story. What did you teach in high school? I taught English, wow. among various other things. <laughs> and it was very involved in athletics. But I, over the 20 years I had in education, I taught English, history, etc. Excellent. 
Bjorn Lawfield. I have no information on you. Tell me a bit about yourself. Ken, Ken go he didn't give you the bio I sent no, over. No, no. Well, uh, let me see if I can remember it. Uh, it's always better live anyway. Yes. <laughs> well, first of all, I'd like to say a big thanks to Ken for having this whole thing here. And uh, everybody loves Ken Goley. That's what I always say. <laughs> I, I attended uh, college in Washington State at the Evergreen State College. And that's where I first became exposed to the concept of organic foods and, and herbal, you know, cleansing the body as a way of, uh, of maintaining good health. And uh, subsequently, as a result of having children and needing to earn a living, I, I got a postgraduate degree in nuclear medicine technology and ended up working in the hospital situation for a few years and uh, quickly became aware of uh, how people's dietary and lifestyle choices were really affecting their health. As a nuclear medicine technologist, I was basically monitoring the progression of people's diseases. And, uh, and I didn't really like it that much. It, uh, it was interesting to know about physiology and anatomy and that sort of thing, but working with radiation and just monitoring people's illness, holding their hands basically right. a little bit as you took these. What uh, are you doing now? Now I own a natural food store and I have since 1987. And uh, that's, that's what forced me into it, was uh, working in the allopathic medical situation. I realized that I could do a lot more good if I was working in the preventative area of health and wellness. So I've been doing that ever since. And I'm a big promoter of organic foods. I think organic foods uh, lower the toxic burden for the individual consuming the foods. And also for the planet, there are fewer chemicals being dropped on the planet. And uh, I think that the planet and the people on it are really approaching a crisis. Uh, you know, it's like goldfish living in a small tank. We're all, we're all breathing the same air. You know, what, what people do in China affects us here. Oh, does it ever? Um, welcome to the panel. Thank you. Uh, Mary Beth McHugh is uh, RD, LDN, CDN, 1980 BS in foods and nutrition degree designed by the American Dietetic Association. She completed a fifth year dietetic internship, successful certification for registered dietitian. I am a diabetic as well. And uh, food is the most important single uh, issue to uh, diabetics along with exercise probably. And let me enter the same time Stuart uh, Erner who's an MD. He is uh, from out of Tufts University. Came here uh, 26 years ago to uh, practice medicine, did a lot with, um, with overweight people, I think. So a, a great deal of uh, nutritional information involved with that, and then began an, an integrated the treatment approach as well. I uh, wish we had more of those in the area, but welcome, doctor. Well, we've already heard some. We, we've heard about organic foods um, a little bit. Mary Beth, what's your view of organic versus uh, commercially raised with uh, fertilizer and the rest? How big a difference? huge difference. There's about 120 natural minerals and uh, nutrients in the soil and they put back, well, they are processing plants for vegetables and fruits uh, in this country. They put back about seven. So the organic industry has that many more, you know, over a hundred more nutrients that you're getting when you're eating organic. And I think the main problem with most people in terms of their chronic condition is that they're purely not getting enough real whole foods, real nutrients. And, um, you know, everybody that is out there with this movement of integrative uh, medicine and prevention and wellness um, will attest to that, that that's, that's like the foundation. Well, the, we have a huge problem all across America that we know and apparently gets worse by the year and that we're fat. Uh, Americans are overweight, way overweight, apparently, according to uh, the statistics I see every year, and I would assume that's primarily dietetic. Well, um, I guess the first thing I want to say, I myself was overweight, about 60 pounds more overweight than I am now, so that's what brought me into the field. But it's not just about eating more than you need and lack of exercise. That is part of it, but uh, choosing the wrong types of foods, getting back again into whole foods versus processed foods, um, looking at chronic conditions in the body that are going on that are, are actually getting in the way of a healthy body composition. 
Um, that's, that's a lot what we do and what, what the practices of uh, functional nutrition, functional medicine, looking at what are the dysfunctions, what are the imbalances, hormonal imbalances, gastrointestinal tract imbalances that may be in the way of a healthy blood sugar level, healthy insulin um, output, healthy uh, metabolism of nutrients, healthy lean mass composition. Uh, but Bjorn, isn't organically grown food more expensive? than commercially grown? Yes, it is. It is. Yeah. Is that, a, is that a real stopper for a lot of people? I, I, suspe I suspect that it is. You know, I, I personally think that uh, it's a lot easier to maintain good health than it is to try and regain it after you've lost it. Um, I don't know if you've checked the price of uh, one night at the ICU, but I think, I suspect you could buy a year's mm -hmm. worth of organic food for it. Probably. And I also want to add to that, there's a lot of farms. Just a second, we're getting a lot of feedback here from these little bell mics. Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a shift in technology. Yes. Go to this and pass it. Just turn off for you. I just want to add to that about the um, cost of organics. There's a huge price to pay every day if you're not feeling well, um, based on what was just said. The other thing is that there's many organic farms. I give a list of them uh, in this area to my clients and encourage people to be members as well as go to the, uh, the organic uh, health food stores. You can buy a membership for one person for an average of $350 for six months and get weekly or every other week a big package of organic produce. Um, Dr. Renner, when, when you're advising people on nutrition, how much of a deal is it organic versus uh, non-organic food? Is that a major point to you? or It does play into uh, my recommendations, but th there are a couple of other problems that are very practical. Not only the cost, although if the insurance companies would pay for organic food, uh, this could be, this could encourage more people to, uh, to eat it instead of that ICU bill. Um, the problem is we don't have a lot of availability in the area. People have to travel distances and now with the price of gas, for example, they're not as anxious to get in the car and go out to, a, to an organic farm and pick up uh, what they want. We have an ongoing controversy, for example, in Albany for, uh, at the Honest Weight Food Co-op, which has been basically vegan and or actually more strict vegetarian, and now there's a movement to bring organic meats and poultries, et cetera, in, and there's a big controversy right now because the people who want to keep that particular facility vegetarian don't want animal products in there, and the other, you know, the other side wants, wants them brought in. Let, let me go back for a minute to talk about obesity, which is, one of, is still one of the most misunderstood medical issues in this country. Last year, I had the opportunity to attend the Time Magazine ABC News Summit on Obesity, as it was called. I was one of four physicians invited to this conference in the country, actually. And this was a meeting of people from uh, government, other political organizations, um, food growers, restaurateurs, everybody involved in the equation of our epidemic of obesity in this country. And the problem is, as I see it, the realizations that these groups are just coming to right now, those of us who have been in this field have been aware of for 40, 50 years. And now suddenly everybody's opening their eyes to the fact that obesity is a serious medical condition, yet health insurance coverage, again, for this condition is still suboptimal. There is, in the capital region, no coverage for obesity from any HMO. However, if you are fortunate enough, for example, to have the Empire Plan or some of the non-HMO insurances, they will pay for the treatment of obesity as long as it's in association with other medical problems. Well, 99.99% of the time, it's in association with other medical problems, such as high blood pressure, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, gout, arthritis, stroke, and on and on and on and on. So we have this major barrier to treatment still that exists in 2005. And ironically enough, we had coverage from these HMOs when they first started. I was involved in setting it up in 1982, in fact, with CDPHP. In 1990, they got rid of the coverage for the treatment of obesity. CDPHP, MVP followed thereafter, and they're the two big insurers locally. And it was interesting because uh, we had a meeting one night. 
They brought in an expert, CDPHP, from outside, from uh, George Washington University. And I don't know if any of you watch professional wrestling, but the results of the match are known before the match occurs, as we all know. It's all entertainment. Well, this person was brought in as a hired assassin, if you will, to state that obesity was not a medical problem at all. And after this 10-hour meeting, which ended at about 2 a.m., the conclusion was there should be no treatment for obesity covered by the insurance company because it's not a medical problem. Uh, I, I was at this meeting, and as you can imagine, I was quite agitated. I, I, the, the afterward to this story is the guy who was brought in, whose name I won't mention, to debunk obesity as a condition, six months later wrote a diet book on how to lose weight because it was, at that point, suddenly it became an important condition to treat. But that is the biggest issue. And I spoke with Tommy Thompson at that meeting last year, as it were, who was the former Secretary of Human Health and Services. He no longer is. And we had a talk after his lecture, and I talked with him about this problem. And oddly enough, just several months ago, I got an email from the organization saying that he had, he had gone back to the government and, and got Medicare to re finally recognize obesity as a medical disorder. And it was due to this conversation, so he said in the email, with this doctor whose name I don't remember from Albany, me. Huh. Now, we have this recognition, but we still don't have any coverage. That is still several years away. But we're talking about a complex disorder. It's not simply eat less and exercise more. Look at me, I'm not exactly thin, but I was until I went on a medication five years ago that caused me to gain 60 pounds. I've lost 20 of them. I lose about a pound or two every month if I'm lucky. Are you still on the medication? I'm still on the medication and can't get off it, but I'm in the lowest dose, trying to get off of it. And the thing is, when I evaluate a patient with obesity, and I've been doing this in this area for 26 years and I've seen thousands of patients, I have to look at all of these things as I evaluate a patient. What, are, what medications are they taking? What foods are they eating? What are the medical problems that they have? And it's a very complex situation for which we still don't have any good treatments. What you should be asking them is what restaurant they're going to. <laughs> Can you make money in the, at, a, at a vegan restaurant in this area? Can you make money uh, not selling uh, meat dishes? Probably not. Tell us about that. Probably not. I had a very interesting conversation two days ago a young man, 41 years old, called me from a restaurant that um, he and his family have owned for 75 years. It's on Long Island. And um, he was obese. And he had the, what, the gastric operation. And he's lost, uh, I think he went from 450 to, now he's about 250 pounds. His journey can be described like this. He said to me, um, what is the responsibility of restaurant tours, restaurant owners taking care of the public in terms of what they eat? I couldn't answer the question because it is very, very complicated. And as my friend Joe Messina said a little while ago, the restaurant industry is, is um, economically driven at its bottom line. And of course, the whole controversy in terms of um, what the public wants versus what they need and um, what is our responsibility. And I don't know how to answer anything else more on that except that Did you're not going to make money if you're a vegan restaurant. What about up. organic food? Could you make money opening a restaurant, big sign, organic only? Uh, I think it uh, depends upon the, the density of the population. Uh, I don't know what's happening in New York City from that point of view. but. Uh, still, this area, the Al Albany, small Albany as we call it, um, with less than a million people, I don't think the, uh, the population is uh, demanding that this be right. available. How Maybe many, there's one in Saratoga. Maybe there's one in Albany. How much of the problem is fast food? Yeah, are the it's McDonald's huge. and the, uh, I mean, they do a huge business. Yes, they is do. That, is that the cause of obesity? Um, well, they're not the cause. People going there is the cause, but is that... Uh... The statistics correlate with that as fast food uh, became increasingly popular as well as processed foods, the obesity rates have gone up. I mean, that's many research studies. What else are Americans doing? Are they eating fruits and vegetables or are those diminishing in, uh, in, in quantity in America's diet? I think, they're, dimi know? I think they're diminishing. Well, 
<laughs> there's another problem that's come up recently in the field of obesity medicine, which we call bariatrics. And this is the concept of food sensitivity and its role that it plays in obesity. And we see the problem in two areas. If people are eating foods that they have a uh, immunological sensitivity to, and this is not to be confused with food, traditional food allergy, where somebody, as you know, might eat a food and immediately get hives, an immediate rash, they could even go into anaphylactic shock. We're talking about delayed reactions that tend to occur maybe two to four hours after the food has been ingested, and then depending upon gastrointestinal transit time, these reactions can last for 72 hours. And they can compound each other. And unfortunately, they don't involve one organ system in the body. They involve all of the organ systems in the body. And what we believe now is that the way they can aggravate an obesity issue is by causing an excessive secretion of cortisol from the adrenal glands. Cortisol makes your blood sugar go up, your insulin levels go up, you get a signal to store more fat. And this can be happening while you're eating healthy foods. The first, one of the first people I tested in my practice was sensitive to broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, things she had been told because she was obese that she should be eating all the time. And her weight was stuck while eating these foods. We removed the foods from, the, from her diet and she was able to start losing weight again. I see that a lot as well, a lot of food intolerances. Many people have them, they don't, they don't even realize it, but they're all at different levels at different degrees, and there is, there is an amount of um, recovery from these intolerances I, that you're experiencing probably as well. The, I, the important thing is for them to identify it uh, and, and to also nourish and, and help heal the, the adrenal glands. So these things are um, healable to a certain degree. It's just many people have them, and they don't realize that they do. And one of the big problems is the realization of this for many people is psychologically devastating. You're telling people in many cases that the foods they love to eat, healthy or otherwise, they shouldn't be eating for a period of several months. The good news is you can reintroduce, as Mary Beth just said, you can reintroduce the foods gradually after you've stayed away from them for a period of a few months, but you have to be very careful. It requires a lot of monitoring. You have to make a huge commitment to this. And I mean, obviously, most people are not going to be willing to do this. We all still are looking for that easy answer. Does Willard have very many obese people at Precipice? Does what? Does Bjorn have very many people? Bjorn, do you have any obese people walking into your... Uh... Well, you don't have to walk far to see people that are overweight in the United States these days. And I'm sure we get a fair, our fair share of them. Um, Probably not as large a percentage as you'd see in Walmart or at McDonald's or something like that, but most of the people who come in my store are people who've taken responsibility for their own well-being. They're making choices, including the choice to walk through the door and patronize a store that carries organic foods. They're making choices toward their taking the control of their own wellness and their well-being. I am very clear about that. I am not a nutritionist. I do not prescribe. Believe me, my brain gets picked and picked and picked and picked, and I will share any knowledge that I can help, but I will not prescribe and I will not take responsibility for anyone's health other than my own. But do you suggest green tea or black tea or something like that for you? Uh, if people come in the store, they probably already think no, they no. want to find some green tea. I'll show them where it is. Right. <laughs> Anybody concerned about uh, chlorine and that uh, we have fluoride in the water? Um, most commercial, most cities drinking water has chlorine, uh, and I think everybody's fluoridating now. Uh, and there's some indication now that, that fluoride may be a problem. Well, I think that those chemicals and a whole variety of chemicals that have been added into the food stream in this country over the past 50 or 80 years are, are a tremendous question mark. Um, the fact is we're all part of a huge experiment in, in, in mass dosing of drugs and chemicals which has never ever been done on the planet before. We in effect are all guinea pigs. Let me ask you before you pass the mic, because of your nuclear medicine experience, what do you think about using radiation to preserve foods? I'm not in favor of that. Okay. I was just going to say that um when you listen to the experts in environmental medicine talking about the toxins in our environment, um, it, it's very alarming. You almost start to think that you really can't live 
You know, you can't take a shower, you can't breathe the air in your house, you can't buy new furniture without, you know, getting the off gases off in two weeks the way you're supposed to do it. So what I want to add to that is every little thing you do in a positive direction for, to the body makes a difference. Uh, one of the things we, we do where I work at Fallon is we detoxify people with um, products and with, with diet to help get rid of some of the toxins that have accumulated in the body for years through medications, through processed foods, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so on an ongoing basis, if you have an organic meal once a week, if you detoxify the body in a proper way once a year, if you, you know, try to control stress and all the things that we're talking about today, it helps the body with these impacts of toxic toxicity that are all around us um, a, a little bit better, much better actually. Mm. We have the amazing capacity to heal, and so we should never lose hope. And with a good detoxification program, you can eliminate toxins from your system, but again, it takes a lot of hard work because it took a lot of years for these toxins to build up in your system, and a lot of them you're taking in, you may not even be aware that you're taking them in, so again, it's more education, but the body can heal. Harold, I, I was interested that apparently restaurateurs are talking about whether or not they have a responsibility to fat America, is that... Uh... I, I think in the years that I own my, my restaurant, I, I asked that question many times. You, you would refuse to serve someone who was obviously inebriated another drink? Absolutely not. In fact, I'll give you a story. My insurance man came to my restaurant one night, drunk. <laughs> I refused to serve him. And he refused to be my insurance man after that. <laughs> really? <laughs> I think you got the better part of the deal. I think I got the better part of the deal. Did you ever refuse to serve someone because they'd eaten too much? Uh, no. Or they're too fat? No. You probably couldn't. I probably could not. Without being sued. But. Something like that. <laughs> my responsibility in terms of when we decided, my wife and I decided to go into the business, what propelled us, and we had many motivations to do so, what propelled us was a, what I would call a um, quality of life issue. But we had been practicing it for many years to begin with, so getting into the business was not, um, uh, w was not totally blind. And we began to search for people that had good products. Fresh, fresh eggs, fresh milk. I remember buying fresh cream from a local farmer. And then we got into local farmers, and we got into, into what in those days, in the, in the 70s, is organic foods, uh, I don't know what we called them then, we just called them fresh foods. And anybody here that's over 60 years old, um, we are, right? Yeah. And Ken, Thank you. I don't know why I'm sitting here, you know, you forced me into this. So I'm not saying you're a nice guy to begin with anyway. Yes, I know, it's a terrible thing. Oh, it's a terrible thing. But I can remember telling somebody uh, earlier today that when I was a small boy, in the 40s, we had good food. I don't remember a convenience packaged food in the house. And I remember my mother cooked everything from scratch. And that, we brought that into our restaurant. We cooked everything basically from, from scratch. Even in, our, even in our breads, we looked for our organic uh, foods and uh, organic flour, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the things I wanted, to, and I'm getting off of it, but one of the things I wanted to say was, how many people are here today? And if this isn't an any indication that the public in general is not very interested in taking responsibility for their health, I or still their, to this or government or uh, their, exactly right. I still think it's amazing. I get out of my car and I'll go into a place to buy food, and I go to the what I call it the coop. I go out of the coop a lot to buy food. The fact of the matter, we people just love to stay in our cars and order the food like we do at a bank. We sit in the car because we don't want to get out of the car. Can you imagine we can't get out of the car? Now, that probably has some good reasons for it. Maybe there's a kid in the back seat throwing up and we can't, you know, we're hungry and we have to continue. But I, there's a social problem here. There's a convenience issue here. There's, there's, there are so many layers of issues here in terms of living a healthy life. It's why, such an incredible choice. Why are so many poor people fat? 
Is it because carbohydrates are cheap? Is that? I think that um, when you're disenfranchised and you're, you have a, a, a feeling of isolation, uh, food is a restaurant tour, and I were talking yesterday, gives us pleasure. Hmm. It gives us a sense of security. It gives us a sense of, of well-being, even though it is. But there appears to be an economic issue as well, because yes. so many poor people yes. are really seriously overweight. Yes. And I think they're eating, uh, they're, they're trying to save money on what they're eating and making themselves fat. Mm -hmm. I so agree. So good food I is expensive. It. We, could, you know, not, we could not afford to feed six and a half billion people on this planet with organic food. We couldn't raise it. Very expensive. Uh, I, before I pass this on, I have a, I have a good friend who, um, who has a, an organic garden in um, Chatham, New York. And he sells all of his organic food to some very fine chefs in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. But those are the only people that can afford it. But that's where his market is. And I agree, it's not true. But that's where he sells, and that's what I hear most of the time. I buy organic food, but I gotta get in my car on a Saturday morning, travel to Troy, go to the, the, um, the market there. Uh, near the, I mean, you have to make choices to eat good food. It takes a lot of energy. Yes. It's a lifestyle, of course. Yeah, but you can't reform America. It's yeah. just, it is. I know. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 a different world, and, and we're not gonna we're not gonna change the world. There's a lot of dynamic going on here. There, when, 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 when we were little, uh, women were in the house. They were not out working, and that's part of what's going on now because mothers are not home to cook all day. They're hmm, I don't, la there's no such word as lazy. It's just a question of motivation in which direction, and they're motivated elsewhere. It's not important to them because they don't understand it's important to them because they're not here. If, yeah, exactly. It's like the news. You got to tell them what they want to hear. If you go on the air and start telling them, good evening, there's bad news tonight, you can hear the channels turning. You can't do it. Um, and it's the same sort of a... I know they do, but you know what? We're not going to reform America, and all you can do is be responsible for yourself and your family at the moment and talk to people you love, but I've given up any thought of reforming uh, this country. As, as total. Of course. May I? Yeah. May I? Go. May I? <laughs> we can sit here and play Ain't It Awful for the next hour, right? right? But I don't think we should go that direction. I think we ought to be talking about, I think we ought to be talking about solutions. And I'm very involved and very proud to say that I'm involved in a solution, a small one but it's a solution. My office deals with all of the high school programs in the state of New York that has hospitality, tourism programs. I deal with a curriculum for high school juniors and seniors. That brings me also to the college campuses in New York State that has hospitality, culinary programs. CIA, Paul Smith's Schenectady Community, RIT, Rochester Institute of Technology, Alfred University, Erie County, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What is going on in these programs, especially on the high school level, and I see it trickling down into junior high school, is we're beginning to teach the kids about nutrition. 
our generation is somewhat, are we, you know, we're not, we've kind of lost it a little bit. But with these wonderful nutritionists today, and we're actually bringing curriculum and bringing the discipline to these young kids because that's part of the solution. And that's where we got to go. The Food Network, two years ago, decided to approach. They're in the grammar schools with famous chefs teaching the kids about nutrition. Well, I just wanted to say about food that there's been an infantilization of uh, the food taste in America. Basically, foods are, are marketed to young people. You can see that any Saturday morning with all the sugar pop cereals that are on. My, my, my daughter asked me the other day, she she's resents it because people look at us as though, you know, sort of like being the minister's kid, you know. Well, we don't want to let those people know that we ate something bad. She said, why do people think that health food is so weird and, and yucky, and yet they'll eat orange crunchitos that turn their hands a completely strange color and consider that normal? And in fact, as getting back to the, 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 the obesity problem mm -hmm. with, the, uh, with poor people, it is a huge problem. And uh, the store that I opened in Troy, I bought it from a woman who um, used to save part of the money she would earn and donate bags of organic lentils and organic rice to the food pantry, things which you can live on very successfully and very modestly. But she was told, we don't want bags of rice. We don't want bags of lentils. Nobody will take them. You've got to donate something that's in a box, mm -hmm. something that's ready to eat. People want instantaneous uh, uh, pleasure stimulation for their, for their, for their sensory. There's also enormous ignorance, though, and I, and I think that's, that's the problem she was noting. I don't think people know what to eat. I don't think they know what's good for them. I don't think they know carbohydrates. And carbohydrates are cheap and fattening. Um, because, and the best news I've heard is we're starting to teach in school again what to eat. Where else are they going to learn it? Well, I can tell you my, my son's having a birthday party today, and he informed us um, we're having store-bought pizza and oh. chicken wings. And, you know, he didn't get a rise from us, so he repeated it. He didn't think we heard. We're having store-bought pizza and chicken wings. It's important to him to fit in with his peers. He doesn't want to be having homemade pizza or, or, God forbid, a whole roast chicken, you know? He wants what his friends know. Did he win? That's what they had at the... Yeah. Oh, it's... I, I'll pick my battles better than How old is he? Are. Fifteen. They win, yes. <laughs> mm, I know the... Uh, Whatever. I was going to say, I think people do know more about what they should be doing. I just, from the patients that I see, clients I see, their lives are spinning out of control. They are stressed out. They have no time for things you, you have to have time for. And one of them is eating in a healthy way. Um, and it's so much about a, a very neg negative, ill-driven culture that we live in, if you ask me. I and mean, you go to... people even cook. Yeah, I mean, you, know, you go to a country like Italy, there's gardens all over the place, everybody's cooking, you know? I mean, we don't have that here, and little by little, there are organizations, uh, institutions, whatever, that are trying to change that, to try to make a difference. Um, people are just, they, they can't even think about the concept of cooking a meal, a lot of them. Ed, you brought up, do Americans know how to eat? I'm here to say that one of the biggest catastrophes in the history of nutrition in this country was our old food pyramid, mm. which as we now learned after the fact, which not infrequently happens in so many areas in science, what they called science, and it turned out it, it was pseudoscience, also helped fuel the epidemic of obesity because everybody was being hammered over the head to eat more pasta, more bread, more rice, more carbs, more carbs, more carbs. And yeah, in, in fact, economics, and you know, it's been a huge upward, you know, it's been a huge battle for us to try to get this to be changed. And recently, as you may know, there was a there were some modifications made. It's still not where it should be, and you know, when you look at the science of it, it's everybody wants to oversimplify this. I wish it were so simple. I would have a hundred percent success rate with my bariatric patients if it were, but it's not. And the fact is, the macronutrient content of diet, in other words, how much protein, fat, and carbohydrates and the types that you're eating and the other issues we talked about before, do go into the equation as to how easily or how difficult 
it will be for you to lose weight? Will you be able to keep the weight off, et cetera? And I mean, it's going to take a long time to solve the problem. And you should know, for those of you interested, the drug companies are working on this, but they have a different approach. They are going to cater to the needs and wants of Americans. Their goal is to develop new drugs for the treatment of obesity that are going to allow people to eat whatever they want and not gain weight. They found cortisol. They're all selling now. Um, the fact is that may help create a thinner population of Americans who are going to die of all the other diseases that they develop due to poor nutrition. That's, that's the, yep. the negative side of that. I'm going to end this panel, and the reason I'm going to do it is because I think we're preaching to the converted here. Um, I'm interested in everyone who's here. Um, I'm also interested in the people aren't the rest of America that's fat and obese, but they're not here and they're not here to see it. So you are all here, and the advice is eat organic, think about what you're doing, cook it and eat well. But I think most of you know that. Uh, on the way home, maybe you could go through McDonald's and give people this or something, and, because <laughs> the people who need it aren't here. I live in Schenectady. I am on a strictly organic diet. When I want to go out to eat, I have to go to Lenox or to Great Barrington. There are four organic restaurants in those areas. As far as I know, there is no place here that I can eat out organically. Can you recommend anywhere? Beekman Street Bistro in Saratoga just opened this summer. It's in the, old, it's in the art district that they're um, now creating there. They buy mostly organic through um, local farms. They have a lot of different things on their menu, like rabbit and you know things that you wouldn't typically see. And their menu changes like every three or four days based on what's in the area. So Beekman Street Bistro. Beekman Street Bistro. And I think there's one other thing that we need to be attentive to, is the fact that we have structures in government that are supposed to be helping us as taxpayers lead a better life, a healthier life. And what we're finding is that even when they redid the food pyramid, the food processors got involved in that process and they picked that apart. So it's not even as, it's slightly better than what we had, but it's being promoted as the new. Because the lobbyists got hold of Exactly. Exactly. And what is happening is that these special interest groups are driving their agenda right through our lives like a Mack truck. And we are all, as a result of it, struggling to lead a healthy life. But, but we don't have to struggle. We don't have to use that food pyramid. We don't use that food pyramid. I, just because I'm a dietitian, I don't have I, to use that. Mary Beth, I understand that. But that's the thing that's being promulgated to the general population. We understand that. The fact of the matter is they, they don't. The exactly. general population do not understand but that's it. Why and they, now that it's being produced and promulgated by the government, that's an imprimatur that, yes, this is the way we do it. This is the best way. If it wasn't, the government wouldn't be doing it. But we don't have to use it with our clients, with our patients. We can right. make different, better choices. And the people in this room are attuned. The problem is there aren't a lot of overweight people in this room. It's certainly not representative of America, and we can't reform America. And I think that's where that influence of 20 people comes into play. Yeah, go talk to people. Exactly. When you're exactly. talking about where to go to eat or what you're going to have as a group when you get together, you get a menu that makes sense and that's healthy and that's how it, it well, spreads. Well, maybe we also should lean a little on Harold to uh, get some of his friends to open a, uh, a restaurant in Albany that deals with uh, yeah. organically grown food. There would seem to be a market. And what you might now be able to tell them is, gee, I found a market of three people who are interested. That's the problem, isn't it? That, that's a problem. Uh, I, what I wanted to share with everybody is that my office also uh, monitors uh, the state legislature. And maybe many of you know there was a um, bill uh, that was shot down. But again, at least there was a bill, and it got somebody's attention, that the restaurant tours across the board have to list all of the ingredients that they have for every single dish that they present. Well, you can imagine the complexity of that. Being a former chef with three chefs standing next to me, all doing the, basically the same thing, and somebody puts a little pinch of this in here and a little bit more of a pinch over there and so on, and what you end up with is it just 
Yeah, but Forget I, it. I was part of that bill being written, and let me tell you why. Go ahead. Because a, uh, a woman a, uh, who was actually one of Jack McEnany's constituents went to a wedding reception, ate something that had peanuts in it, had an allergic reaction, and died. Right. And the, the argument was there are a lot of allergy to peanuts. If you're going to make a dish with peanuts in it, list it. Yes, absolutely. And there's other allergies, and that's what it all stemmed from. But it all stemmed, actually, I called McEnany and got him in touch with this woman's mother who had a point. Well, I think that, as Ken and I have talked many times in the past, um, this is not going to go away. This is going to have a tremendous impact on the, on the restaurant industry. But we're a long way from it because of just the complexity of of the diversity and, and, and of ethnic restaurants and mm. and trying to the uh, I mean my mind is just boggled down in the just the sheer complexity of yeah, it's a, it sounds like a good idea but it's almost impossible, impossible to implement to implement right. can you can you say the um, uh, Kentucky fried chicken passing out there their, their uh, <laughs> recipe for <laughs> their fried chicken I don't think so <laughs> you got a That's point. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Secret. I think we did a great job of not uh, killing smoking. Well, according to Kevin Trudeau, there are a lot of chemicals being put into the food supply, too. Chemicals in fast food restaurants and in packaged foods, which uh, can induce addiction or uh, also can uh, suppress the signal of being full mm -hmm. so that you continue to eat it. Because as he points out, these food companies. They need to make a profit. They are obligated by law as corporations, publicly held corporations, to turn a profit yep. for their shareholders. How do they do that? They get more people to eat more food. And as Kevin also points out in the book, fat people eat more than thin people. Hmm. They have Good less, customers. they have Good more time at the table because right. they're not out running around. Okay, thank you all. Comment. Yes, go. to eat healthy. Yes, that's part and of what we were talking about. Yes, and I, I cheese. would love to hear something about this, how we can make this more accessible to an average American. Myself as an artist, I shop at Honest Weight, but I have to tell you, I have to shop very carefully. There are many products in there I cannot afford. I would love to go to all of these restaurants, but I cannot afford it. Bjorn, I don't think she can so, afford your store. I, I, I can't afford Green Grocer in, in Clifton Park. I'm sorry, I can't pay two ninety nine for a cucumber. I'm an artist. I'm being quite frank with you. Uh, and I'll be frank with you and with everybody. I've, I've tried to educate people about this so many times. Do you realize if I pay two fifty for that cucumber and end up throwing a third of the case away because I don't sell them in time, you know, it's... Uh, but then I've got people pounding and saying, I want cucumbers. So if I'm going to get them in, Good I've got you. to put them out there. <laughs> but I can't shop there as much as I would like to. I live right down the street from you, and I would be in there at least once a week if I could afford something. Do you know what I can afford in there? The little ginger candies, and that's what I come to get. And I do. I come to get the ginger candies. And I love your store. I do. But I truly cannot afford almost everything in that store. Go to the Whole Foods website. One of the things I was trying to do was to get people in this area, go online and ask Whole Foods to look at this area because I think there's enough to go around. I don't think we're going to be taken away from people's businesses. And I mean, there's a huge population in this area for a Whole Foods market. And it's going to be lower in price. I have two other suggestions for you. Ask for the artist's discount or raise the fee that the band charges. Whoa, wait a minute. I'm the client here. I have I have one more one, <laughs> I I have one more comment if I may. One more comment if I may. You know, um, I remember my basic uh, economics class. If the general population wanted to eat organically grown cucumbers, there would be so many people planting cucumbers. Therefore, the price would have to come down. Is, is it not something about supply and, demand? supply and demand? And this good man could charge 
29 cents a cucumber if he had the people lined up outside of his, let's face it, McDonald's sells hamburgers. Zero cucumbers. <laughs> <laughs> because people are lined right. up. Maybe you know. their salad, I can tell you that. It's mostly <laughs> I, lettuce. Oh, right. <laughs> it's, it's actually cheapest in Greece. Listen, they just poked me in the side and pointed out to me I'm now running an hour and a half late. And this is it. It's 310, and I'm supposed to have four more panels in before 4 o'clock. Yeah. I thank you all, and I want you to wish me luck. <laughs> this is what Nat King Cole had to say about nutrition. So listen closely. I don't want French fried potatoes or red rag tomatoes. I'm never satisfied. I want the frim frim sauce with the awesome cake and chiffonka on the side. I don't want pork chops or bacon, cause that won't awaken. fast panel partially because I'm late and uh, in, in many ways because perhaps we know why medical expenses are so high and we've been watching them go uh, up and up you know it is argued that the uh, the people who pay for medical procedures in this country is business and the people who drive the uh, the effort to squeeze down medical costs are business because they are paying and I don't know as you know how that came about but during World War II we imposed wage and price controls on America and businesses wanted to hire uh, people 
They could not offer higher wages. What they could offer were fringe benefits, medical insurance, and that's largely how it started. It now has reached the point that medical insurance insures most people in this country, which is why business is driving the pressure to hold down medical costs more than anyone else, because business is paying the cost at the moment. I can tell you I did a forum last year on medical costs, and last year General Electric told me that they were anticipating a 25% increase this year in their pharmaceutical costs. That's one year, 25%. And you know what's happening. Businesses are being squeezed. You are being squeezed with higher co-payments. And in some cases, um, health insurance is being dropped. Many employers, in fact, are now looking to hire as many part-timers as possible because they don't have to extend full benefits to them. And the result is we are losing, Americans are losing health insurance. Uh, I think there's 46 million of us currently uninsured in America. I have no idea what's going to happen to those people or to the rest of us if costs keep going up, and they have been skyrocketing. So let's uh, meet the members of this panel. Sandy Denbesten, how are you? That's a pretty hard name. Dutch name. Dutch name. Lives in Kinderhook, and she's married. Her husband's name is Troy. Licensed broker specializing in health insurance marketplace in the Capital District. She has 10 years experience in the health insurance field uh, and she's going to really know what, what's going on and why the costs are going up so fast. Um, are you Frank Lizzie? Yes, you are. Frank is um, hematology, 1972, internal medicine, 1976. Graduate of Siena College, Albany Medical College. Internship was at Albany Med, then he went to Tufts School of Medicine. Uh, an MD with, continue, uh, with considerable experience in probably the other end of health care, uh, the forms in triplicate to the uh, health insurance agencies, the difficulty of getting repaid from uh, third-party purveyors. It's all part of it. Um, let me start. Who wants to start first with the general reason why uh, we're driving costs up so rapidly? Sandy? Yeah. Health insurance premiums have been escalating, as Ed said, at double-digit levels since the year 2000. There's, there's many reasons that go into that. Um, Three billion prescriptions are consumed by Americans on an annual basis. Um, that's a pretty significant number. There's many reasons health insurance premiums go up. One of them is an aging population. Um, according to the National Health Care Coalition, by the year 2008, 15% of our population will be over the age of 65. And according to the U.S. Bureau of, of Statistics, one in every five Americans will be over the age of 65 by the year 2030. Um, why that's significant is people over the age of 65 tend to utilize health care services more. Um, for example, they say that the average cost to someone over the age of 65 for prescriptions is $2,300 a year. Um, so we have an aging population, we're living a better lifestyle, but there's costs associated with that. Isn't there also some wild figure that like 90% of health costs are spent in the last year of life? Um, and it's in this last year as we desperately try to keep people alive that we're spending wild amounts of money. Mm -hmm. So the answer is death. <laughs> uh, in the Terry Schiavo thing, I encountered a physician who uh, had a, a wonderful observation. His father was a physician who put a note, not just do not resuscitate, do not hospitalize. And he said, because if at my age I go to a hospital, they're going to get involved in the extreme measures. They'll go, they'll go to the uh, absolute lengths, and I don't want it. Do not hospitalize. But that's where a lot of the costs occur in that last year of desperate struggle. Frank, can an individual practitioner of medicine exist anymore? You have so many health plans with so many different forms, you probably need five secretaries for uh, just patient forms. That's true, that uh, the general practitioners, solo practitioners are, are less and less common now, and they're usually the big groups. And one of the reasons is that they can share expenses, they can get a, a lot of secretaries, and uh, the, uh, they're covered by the other doctors in the practice. 
So a solo practitioner like myself is a dying breed. Uh, and it is difficult with the insurance companies getting reimbursed, uh, getting approval for using different medications. You have to send in forms and override forms. And uh, it if is, you want labs, God help you. And, and labs, uh, they, they, they're kind of uh, uh, fussy about the number of laboratory uh, tests that you order on patients. You got to give a code for each specific blood test you do. And, um, and, and they're even sending uh, letters out saying, uh, uh, be part of our plan to cut costs on blood testing and uh, uh, do less blood testing. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll cut your costs or something like that. So they are pushing for less uh, expenses for their part. And also the diagnosis codes for patients who come to the office they, they, a lot of times they won't pay for certain diagnosis codes. Uh, obesity, so many insurance companies will not pay for that code. So what I have to do is alter the diagnosis to high cholesterol, which most of the patients do have who are overweight. And so you fudge it. You fudge it a little bit, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it is, it is difficult uh, with the insurance companies. It's a lot of work. and. Uh, private practitioners don't have the time, but you have to make the time, and you do the best you can. Ken, you uh, own the dealership. Jim Morrell, uh, who still owns dealerships and radio stations, I don't know how many people he's giving benefits to. Where does every salesman at uh, Team Goey get health benefits? The, indiv the individual does, and then if they want a family plan, they have to uh, purchase that. They have to. So. Exactly, and uh, I, I was just talking to one of my friends who uh, he and his wife are paying uh, very close to ten thousand dollars for coverage for he and his wife, not mm -hmm. family. He and his right. wife. She's not able to be pregnant, so it's not a, an issue of raising children or having pregnancy to cover. And what the what the employer faces is the fact that these costs keep rising, over which they have absolutely no control. They have no control over who is being seen and for what. And the other thing is that these price rises come and they are significant. Hmm. They, change, the they change the bottom line substantially. Did you and used to offer family insurance to everyone 20 yes. years ago? Oh, ten, 10, yes. 10 years yeah. ago even. So yeah, it's it a was, cut it, yeah, it was in order to be competitive in, in the business, there's certain benefits that you just have to have if you're going to get any kind of people that are are able to hit the ball. And as a consequence, you've got to be right up to speed with everybody and kind of the, the General Motors and the Ford Motor Company and the really big employers are the ones that set this running standard. And as a matter of fact, there's a notice that G GM may have to go bankrupt mm -hmm. because they cannot afford to pay the pension and health care costs because it, they, they now have more people that are retired collecting benefits that they have employees able to generate income to pay the benefits. So Sandy, where are we going? Where, where are businesses cutting back and what's the alternative for people? What most businesses are doing is passing on the costs to the employees either through higher co-pays or they're increasing their payroll deductions. There's When I started in this industry 10 years ago, the um, premium for a family is what the premium is for a single person today. Mm. So it's, it's gone up significantly. And there's many, many different reasons for it. I mean, a lot of them have already been talked about today, like lifestyle choices. Um, I know that there's public advocates out there that say, say if Americans took better care of themselves, we'd see health insurance costs go down. Um, you know, there's medical technology, new medical technology that goes into health insurance premiums. Um, so it's, there's a, really not a lot of choices that the employers have other than to pass the cost along. What's the cheapest you can get at the moment then? Local, I mean, if you have to go buy, is that what you do as you look at various... Uh... I, I work for my clients. I, I try to help find them the most appropriate coverage at the most cost-effective price. So it all depends on the company and what they're looking for as far as what the least expensive is. is what's... Um... Are more and more companies going to part-timers with no benefits or with very limited benefits? I know that's happening in broadcasting. I just wonder if it's more general than that. 
I haven't seen that happen a lot with my clients. It's mainly they're looking to pass the cost along. Just pass it along. Mm -hmm. Questions? Yeah. Just a comment. Um, my husband and I are both self-employed, so we're not even dealing with an employer in our benefits. We're paying them ourselves. And what's frustrating for both of us is um, as we get older, um, luckily neither one of us are on medication or need um, health care. We do our annual checkups and whatever. But it's very frustrating. We're paying over $600 a month out of our pocket for our health care, and we don't use it. So th that's a whole other frustration. Mm. You're really helping the curve. Yeah. <laughs> and the other thing I wanted to mention, are you familiar with the concierge type of medical practice? It's becoming, um, I was at a conference a month ago, and one of the physicians there said that this is the way she was running her practice. She has 200 patients. Um, they pay her $2,000 a year. She does not do any medical billing. Um, but they can use their insurance by her giving them a form or a receipt and they do their own filing. She is on a hospital, um, they can go to the hospital through her. And then in addition to that, I thought, well, not everyone can afford $2,000 a year. And she limits her patients to 200 a year. But they're also doing it for people with less income for $500 a year. And partners are doing it um, so that they can take care of more patients, but they limit their practice to a certain number of people. So I just kind of wondered if maybe that was something that was starting to happen. And I know it is in different areas, but I just wondered if it was happening around here at all. It's called concierge practice. No, I don't know about it. Uh, we do our own billing in our office, which is very difficult. It's a lot of work and it takes a lot of time. And then there's uh, a lot of tricks uh, on billing, a lot of uh, different uh, hurdles to, get, to, to cover. And, uh, so we talked about uh, hiring a billing service to do our billing because it's just so complicated. Yeah, but the concierge, I didn't hear about, but it sounds like a good idea. Yes, they totally did away with the billing from their office and yeah. cut their costs dramatically. Yeah. yeah, but if they want an outside test, a CAT scan or something, then you're back in your uh, normal system with your medical uh, I'm not insurance. I'm not sure how that worked, but uh, according to this physician, it worked very well, and um, mm -hmm. they're continuing to do it. They've done it for a few years now, and before that, she said their practice was not making enough money to survive. Yeah, I can believe it. Yeah. Yes. I, I uh, have uh, an HMO for my insurance, and my understanding was that when the HMOs began, the idea was that they would have bargaining clout with suppliers and so on so that in order to drive down costs. My experience has been that instead, they refuse to pay for things that they're supposed to pay for uh, on the insurance. Uh, th instead of going working their way up, they push down. Am I in correct in my impression or that you know that that was the original purpose and i i just wonder i maybe nobody can answer this but i just wonder why they don't try using their cloud i don't have any clout with a, a pharmaceutical or a supplier of, of durable medical equipment or anything like that but a, a, an insurance company especially a large one would so i think they are um i, I have to inject a thing called Embro, which is $1,300 a month. And my insurance company now has it shipped to me from Florida because it's cheaper for them. They somehow made a deal. And I, there's a lot of that sort of thing going on where I think they are using what clout they have. Um, it's pretty small for uh, BDHP to have any clout against Pfizer. Uh, it's just, yeah. Uh, one of the things that's going on right now in the automobile industry is that the manufacturers themselves are running their own pharmacies right out of the plants so that they're not they're cutting out the distributor ships and the whole deal they're buying direct and they buy where they get the best price and this is one of the ways so they're trying to capture some of these costs but they're also affecting medical practice aren't they perhaps deleteriously uh, in in what they will pay for them. well I'll give you an example I, I have a stress test and because I can't run, mine is injected uh, radioactive. So I don't have to run that damn treadmill. I can't. 
that's ninety percent and accurate they tell me the other one on the treadmill is seventy percent accurate when i asked well then why doesn't everyone get the ninety percent accurate the answer is insurance companies won't pay for so it's affecting medical practice as well i'd also like to go back to your question on hmos and managed care their original intent was managing the care would help keep the cost down but what it's actually done is increase consumer demand i don't know if you remember when the health insurance was more indemnity where you had to pay a deductible and then you had to pay a co-insurance and you used to get a statement that would tell you how much it cost it it would show you that the health insurance carrier um, paid two thousand dollars the doctor billed three thousand dollars here's your portion of the cost um, what happened was you went in with two dollar copays five dollar copays somebody gets a cold they go to the doctor right away they don't have those big expenses coming out of their pocket and over the years those copays have gotten higher but it's actually caused an increase in demand for health care services the other argument they're making is that um, when hmos initially came in because they had more pressure power they were able to squeeze um, medicine practice in general and squeeze out a lot of the um, inefficiencies and that that's now done and there's very little inefficiency to squeeze out of that anymore so that's the reason that medical costs have started to go up at the double digit rate that they had been before HMO started to squeeze a little. In other words we're back to um, probably double digit increases in uh, medical costs annually for the foreseeable future. And the only way that's going to change is if we get into an integrative model where the people start to take more responsibility for their own care. I'll give you just one example. I dropped a piece of a wooden material that had a sharp metal edge on it across my shin and it, it cut me to the bone and it was a cut about this length and it became infected. Mm. And I treated myself with hydro, hydrogen peroxide, washing it out, and washing the wound itself. And I treated it topically with vitamin E, and I took mega doses of C. I didn't go to see anybody. That's not the practice today. No. And number one, they, they, people just don't have the confidence to do that. I just wanted to prove to myself that you could treat yourself very simply and easily with no invasive drugs whatsoever, and you could accomplish healing. You cannot even see a scar where that occurred. And, and yet the cost... If the you cost, had gotten a staph infection or something in there, you would be very quickly... At, yeah, uh, but the C would have counteracted that. You, when you take mega doses of C, you get immune system buildup. And that's the point. And then that was the point that was being made earlier, is that the, 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 the ability of C to counteract the fec infection is astronomical when it's delivered in mega doses. But you cannot take 500 or 1,000 megs. That will not do the trick. Mm. So I, what I'm saying is that that wound cost me a bottle of hydrogen peroxide, which was less than a dollar. It cost me uh, about $4 for the, the vitamin E, and it cost me about $17 for the container of granulated powdered seed. Frank, is, okay. uh, is, is his MD, does that bother you at all? <laughs> you, want, you want him doing that at home himself? Well, he was lucky and the things all got better and that was great. And that plus, if you're in good health, you recover quickly from things. But if you're in bad health, then you don't heal so well. Um, there's another aspect too that the patients feel that since they're paying so much premiums a month for their health insurance, yeah. they should go to the doctor, they should use it. So you do see a, a lot of people coming in uh, because they figure they're paying the money, they might as well get the benefit from it. You know, so, so that's, it goes around too. The other thing is a lot of people don't have a physician. Their, their, their response to a common cold is to visit the emergency room. Yes, which is the most and expensive. The, and the emergency room is loaded with these young families because they don't have a, a physician. Because or, they don't or, have a health Or are plan. they entering into the system in that, in that manner? Their way of entering into the system is to go to the emergency room. Well, if you don't have health care, where do you go? Where do you go? What do you do? And then who pays 
for them because they're not they don't have the ability. we do those exactly. with health care exactly right. because that's what's driving up the hospital costs because those costs are not recoverable they're not being paid yep. for and teaching hospitals in new york have a whole other problem the eight and a quarter uh, is not enough for them so we're uh, teaching hospitals are very important to new york we train more doctors than any other state in the union but our health reimbursement system may be hurting the teaching hospitals we have a lot of work to do but I on think many, many fronts. On many fronts. I thank this panel. Thank um, can we do three minute break? Okay. And we'll get we're gonna get the last panel in somehow. Thank you. <laughs> we're rolling. <laughs> I, guess I don't know if you've noticed, but we've been trying to uh, coordinate the songs today with our speakers. Okay. We went through a whole list of about 200 tunes, and this is the only one we could come up with for these speakers. Every time it rains, it rains, pennies from heaven.
Individual experiences. And they're experts. They better be. Experts on their own experience. <laughs> uh, I know the sound man has to uh, leave at four because he's got a wedding to go to. So I'm uh, I'm going to be quick and I'm going to introduce you uh, one by one and have you describe your experience. Let me start with uh, Mary Beth McHugh. You've been here before. Personal experience? Um, yeah. The reason why I got into this whole area of nutrition. Uh, functional integrated nutrition is because of my own experience with my health. I was, um, I went by this form that, I try to make it go faster, but I had, my symptoms were fatigue, backache, stomach distension, numbing in the right side of my body, fluid retention throughout the, um, the whole body. Um, I just really wasn't functioning. And I went for four months to many physicians, many specialists, um, God knows how much money was spent on testing me. I was even tested for um, MS, and uh, the conclusion was there was nothing wrong with me, um, which is you know exactly what all my clients tell me when when I see them. So I was led to um, the area of integrative medicine, functional medicine, via a professional e-list that I'm on um, by just sharing my symptoms with some other dietitians that practice integrative nutrition, and from there. Uh, one of the first people I went to could barely speak English. He was a trained Chinese uh, ph medicine ph uh, Chinese physician, um, and he told me within 20 minutes for $20 or half half hour for $20 what was going on with me. Um, and this was consistent with physicians I saw down at the Marino Center, which is associated with Harvard Medical School, who are all um, integrative. Actually, the physician I saw he's from Russia. He's an acupuncturist, a naturopath, and an MD. And then um, another whole center that I, I went to for a year and a half was um, integrative manual therapy. It's a form of body work. So what they, they all told me essentially was through a stressful event in my life, I brought up some things that were there for a long period of time. And, and I'd say, you know, everything I'm talking to you about is extremely common with, with many of the people that we see today. Um, and it was some imbalances in my um, digestive system that needed to be balanced. It wasn't able to be seen in conventional medicine because the labs that we use in conventional medicine um, are really designed to see, you know, disease states. And I saw through um, different other functional labs what was actually happening. And so through Chinese herb medicine, um, through supplements, through dietary changes, through stress reduction, I overcame uh, what was going on uh, was something that, you know, five or six physicians in four-month period could not see. I, the most amazing thing is that you, you did get a diagnosis and some help. I, uh, and that's because you saw, you happened to encounter a physician who knew some Chinese medicine and who was far broader in his scope than most American medical school graduates. Right, and he actually, the well, Chinese physician is actually not an American MD. I did see an MD who's an integrative MD. And the other thing is that it was really not important to pinpoint a diagnosis. Many of the practitioners here, we look at symptoms and we treat the symptoms. We try to rebalance the, the imbalance. Mm -hmm. And that's what, was, what they did with, my, with me. How did they know what the imbalance was and how to balance it? Right. How? One example, because I know we're on a time frame yeah. here, I did get a, a test that was essentially looking at um, the balance or the imbalance of my digestive system, which is a very common area many people have problems with. And this was an out-of-state lab. Um, I will add that New York State's the only state in the whole country that does not allow people to get reimbursed uh, labs from out-of-state. Every other state in the country allows people to be reimbursed for out-of-state labs. Anyways, uh, for $130, I was able to see certain imbalances, and then they could pinpoint what to go after with supplements, with herbs, with diet. Mm. Uh, that was one of several different labs, labs to see, look at adrenal functions, 
Um, there's a few other labs that people wouldn't understand here, but wow. So it's from that experience I rolled into. How this do you area. feel now? A, a lot better. Yeah, much better. Excellent. Yeah. Joan, Gary, McGarry. McGarry. I know what your problem is. You had nine children, um, <laughs> and ten grandchildren. I have two, and they drive me nuts. So we don't need any more further diagnosis. Actually, you're a hypnotherapist. And we were talking about that earlier. Yeah. Tell us your Cert personal I'm story. I'm a certified hypnotherapist. Um, I have nine children, ten grandchildren. And I became interested in about 20 years ago in life after life, near-death experiences. I started there. I started to realize that I had intuitive abilities and that I was a medium. And then um, I studied tachyon energy in California. And I studied hypnotherapy and metaphysical counseling um, as a young Catholic. <laughs> Um, I've had just about everything diagnosed that I have heard in this room today. They told me that I had chronic fatigue, chronic fungus infections, I have arthritis, I have osteoporosis, um, I, I've had fibromyalgia diagnosed, and um, I started to go to a man up in Clifton Park about seven years ago, Dr. Richard Herbold, and he has changed things. I'm going to be 65 next week. I don't think I'd be walking around if I wasn't taking the supplements that he gave me and working with him. The good news is I do what he tells me, and I think a lot of people go to the doctors and they leave and it's just too hard to take those vitamins or it's just too much to drink that supplement, what and they of, don't do it. What sort of supplements did he give you, and what do you take? He gives me what I need for my problems. I take something called, um, it's a drink. Don't go, go, go. I probably won't be able to think of the name of it, but he gives me many of the medications that he knows that I need yeah. for this, the problems that I have. But the, the main thing that I came to talk about today is something that started with my eighth child, and the doctor told me that he thought I had cancer, and it was um, a thickening of the skin all around the vaginal area. And over the years, Sean is now in his 20s, that's when they told me I had this. They did biopsies. They said it was not cancer. They told me it was called lichen sclerosis. Many women have it. Well, it, over the years, I mean, it's way too long for you to sit here and tell you what I went through with this problem. And I, it intensified itself about six years ago. And it was horrible. Um, it, it would bleed, and the skin was thin. And in it, I can't tell you, it was very painful. So I thought, well, I'll go to a woman. I'll go over to Bellevue. And I went over to the gynecologist over there, and she brought the dermatologist in, and they did more biopsies. Very painful. They didn't even bother to numb it. And they said, oh, it's like sclerosis. The most severe I've ever seen, so if you wouldn't mind, we'll take pictures of it. Um, and I said, well, as long as my face isn't going to be in them, I guess it's OK. They said they had never seen anything this severe. But they gave me creams, they gave me hormone creams, they gave me this, they gave me that, and, and it didn't help. And it would fade down, and it would be livable, and I would go to work, and I had this problem. But about a year and a half, two years ago, it flared up, and I couldn't even walk. And I was out of work, and I went to my gynecologist, and he said, it's out of my hands. He sent me to a dermatologist. The dermatologist was injecting um, cortisone in there. And I can't tell you, and I bore nine children before they medicated you, I have never been in so much pain in my whole life. I, I couldn't stand till I, I finally said to him, I can't come here for these injections anymore. I can't stand the pain of the needles going in there. He was injecting it into the open sores. So he said, well, I think you better go to a gynecological surgeon. So I went to the very best supposedly gynecological surgeon in this area. And he did another biopsy, and he said, and he was, he said, you know, the Jewish holidays are coming up. I don't have much time for this. You need surgery. And he said, what we need to do is we need to graft all the skin off the inside of your legs, and we're going to replace the skin all around the vaginal area. And I said, will this fix the problem? And he said, I can't guarantee you that. And he said, there'll be an eight-week, you know, just like major surgery, um, there'll be an eight-week recovery. So I decided I would get another opinion, and I went to another, what was supposed to be a very well-known gynecological surgeon in this area, and he pretty much told me the same thing. He said, the only thing I can suggest if you don't want to go through the surgery is I'll send you to a pain management doctor. So I went to a pain management doctor. That's all he did. He had two conferences with me, and he sat me down. He said, here's what I'll do for you. I will numb you from the waist down. 
He said, but what you need to know is you'll be the numb for the rest of your life. And when I numb you from the waist down, if I miss by a hair, you're going to lose your, um, your bowels and you're going to be incontinent. And I'll tell you, I went home that day. This was about two years ago. Devastated. And I said to him, are these the only choices you can give me? And he said, I've seen it. Can you live like that? This is it. So my chiropractor knew about this, and he suggested that I go to his colleague. And I would have done anything because, I'll tell you, I couldn't go to the bathroom. I would have to hang on to a bar of the pain or medicate myself so much. One of the pain management doctor gave me, um, I, I, it's the thing that they give people to take them off drugs, um, methadone. He gave me methadone. I went to work one day and one of the girls said to me, my God, what are you on? Your eyes doesn't, don't even focus. Um, so I went to Dr. Herbold's um, colleague and he took a look at it. And in the meantime, you know, it, it's in a delicate place and I'm going to all these doctors. I think everybody in Albany, you know, knows me when I walk in a restaurant. <laughs> and he took a look at it and he said to me, I can help you with Mr. Fallon. And um, he gave me a cream, and the first cream he gave me had to have so much numbing agent in it because I couldn't put any creams on it at that point. I couldn't even touch it. And I used that for a couple of weeks with his help, and he lowered, he you know, would speak with Dr. Fallon. I can't tell you medically what he did. Unfortunately for me, the man's in the room. He could tell you what he did for me, but in a month and a half, it was so much better that at least I could urinate without so much pain that I would cry. And that was about a year and a half ago, I think, and the problem is just about gone. And the alternative, after um, two dermatologists, two obstetricians, two gynecological surgeons, and a pain management doctor. And the smart thing you did is keep moving on and keep looking at other doctors and keep getting other opinions and not settle for numbing surgery. That well, no, I mean, I, he, he, it was, he was either going to do the surgery on me or he was going to numb me from the waist down. Yeah. He said, that they told me those were my choices. And Dr. Weisberg worked with me and it was gone. It was gone in a couple of months to the point where I could live and go to work. And now a year to a year and a half later, it's, it's, manageable. I mean, it's hardly noticeable that it's there. Well, I'm glad to hear that because it's, a, it's an, an amazing story, but the, um, the discouraging part is having to go from doctor to doctor to doctor to finally find just a cream that, that could do it. Yep. Um, but which because is why he was willing say, to take the time also for me. But the message out of this primarily is you got to be your own doctor. I mean, you are responsible for your own health and can't later on say, well, my doctor told me. Yeah. Well, it's kind of you. Joe Messina, 57 years old, owner-operator of the Adventure in Food Trading Company. Do you sell organic food? We try to. We, we, we try, try to. You mean you can't? Well, um, the, <clears throat> uh, the restaurant industry, for the most part, which is, my, which is most of my business, supplying restaurants, hasn't really accepted it yet. Mm. And... Um, uh, some 15 years ago, uh, I started bringing in wherever I could find natural and organic products, and it's been a very, very hard sell. Wow. Uh, costs Tell us are, your story. Costs are higher, uh, and, and, and the, the, uh, uh, what I think the answer, uh, answer to the solution is, is even in all Albany, in the restaurant mm -hmm. industry, if we get a restaurant, that will go organic, natural, take the path as my friend Green Grocer has, and, and, and get established, and other restaurateurs will see that it works. We will have more organic interest and natural interest in restaurants. Right now, the higher cost of organic and natural is still not acceptable to the restaurant industry, and I have been fighting it for 15 years. Or trying for 15 years. I suppose we also could help by going to any restaurant we go to asking if they have organic. Please, uh, right. And fill out your little cards, your little comment cards, and please put the comment, no organic or natural products. You have no, no organic or natural products, and I'm not coming back. Put that on your little, your little comment cards and ask, ask for organic and natural. 
says here you have philosophy of you are what you eat. Exactly. Explain. Uh, I have to thank my father for that because he was adamant about eating the best and the finest foods we could find. We, uh, and in the same breath, um, you just think about the concept of consuming food, and it either turns into your body, and if it doesn't, you die. And you can either put good fuel in your body, or good energy in your body, or bad energy. So just think, you know, think about that concept. You are what you eat. You absolutely are what you eat. And uh, my father was adamant about that, stomping up and down about it, and making sure we ate, ate very well. What's your personal story? The personal story is, I, is that as, a, as a, in my teens, to start with my introduction to homeopathic medicines, uh, I had, I used to get, when I was younger, I used to get boils, and I'm sure someone here remembers what boils are. And, and I used to get this particular boil in a very uncomfortable so spot on my butt. And I used to have to literally carry a pillow to school to sit through class. And I, as a teenager, carrying a pillow to school is very embarrassing, all right? And of course, the conventional doctor, you know, we'd go, go to the doctor and he would put this salve on it and that salve. And, my father, you know, and we were going nowhere. I still had my boil, and I still kept getting my boil. Boil, boils. My father gets, the doctor comes to the house when they used to make doc, doctor calls, checks out my boil, and does, it does no good. So I'm still walking around in pain. My father gets mad. He goes stomping out of the house, walks out in the field and picks some burdock leaves. Comes back in, makes a poultice, slaps it on, bandages, makes my mother bandage it up. Of course, they, they were kind of in it together. And bandages it up, bandage it up, and in, in less, no time flat, the boil goes away, and I haven't had a boil since, right? And so that's, that's, the, that's the old time story. The, the modern story is, and I'll, I'll try to make it short because I know you're short on time, but a, I'm, a, I'm also a, a farmer as, uh, as a way of life, I'm a farmer, an organic farmer. And, and uh, I live on a farm and I work outside and I get stung by bees habitually three or four times a year. Well, about three years ago, everything's in threes. Three years ago, I developed an allergy to bees and I started getting to the problem where I had to get rushed to the hospital. And I didn't know what to do and didn't really know we had, at the time, didn't know we had integrative medicine here in Albany because I had previously gone for just checkups in Connecticut and to uh, a Dr. Z that some of you, as you may know. And, and I found out that we had, uh, so I went to my conventional doctor, my family doctor, and he suggested, he referred me to a specialist. And in the meantime, I've always been concerned with health and nutrition and eating right, and, and so I was trying to cure this on my own by taking a, a bee, poll bee pollen honey that had bee venom in it. And I was increasing on my own, sending away for this, because you couldn't buy it here in Albany, sending away for it and taking it on a schedule and increasing it and, and seeing and dr eating a lot of honey because I thought I knew honey was good for allergies and reading a lot and, and, and I go to the conventional doctor, allergist, and, and he's telling me what he's gonna do and I'm trying to tell him that I'm taking this bee honey pollen and he said, I don't wanna hear anything, I don't pay any attention to that stuff, that's a bunch of hodgepodge. So my biggest mistake at the moment was not laughing at him and walking out. I respectfully listened to him. He told me that he would make, he would give me, put me on a series of injections. And I said, well, how long will the injections last? And how long, for how many, how, what period of time? He said, we'll do this for the rest of your life. And once again, being a respectful person, I didn't get up and walk out. But I just walked out of the room and I said, you know, I said, thank you, walked out. And I knew that's not what I was going to do because I just wasn't going to live like that under his control, have him control my life forever. Or me have he, 
my, the responsibility of my life being on him. So what if he didn't show up on a holiday or something? All right? So, lo and behold, a friend of mine told me about the Center for Integrative Medicine in Del Mar. I went to them. We started a program. Uh, we started first with a, a dietary program, which was a total shock to me because I thought I was the healthiest eating person in the world. But they explained to me what I was doing wrong. I, it also gave me a lot of interest in reading more about it. We went on a dietary program, and then, then we went on to a bee venom tincture uh, program over a six-week period. Thereafter, uh, I went into, his, went into the office. I was injected with, with bee stings to see if I would react. I had no reaction at all. Uh, and the center for, you know, the, Ron Stram and his team insisted that the only way they were going to trust us, because we had done a modified approach before that didn't work, the only way he was going to accept this was if he came to my house with the team with a box of bees mm. and I was stung at my house out in the country and I caught a bunch of bees, they brought a bunch of bees, we sat on my back porch and I got stung. And I am not allergic to bees any longer. In fact, I was stung Tuesday night mm. right on the top of the head by a bee. So I wonder if you would be immune had you continued the honey with the venom in it, the, 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 the treatment you were uh, doing yourself that the doctor talked you out of? I'll try it my next slide. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave you with reincarnation. I like that. But, uh, hey, it's uh, 4 something and I thank you all. I thank you all for uh, staying for the day. It, uh, I think it's been an interesting day. There's one principal message you, in fact, are your own doctor. You are responsible for your health. You've got to watch what you're, uh, what you're doing and what they're doing to you. So I wish you all the best. Thanks to Ken Bowie for having us all here. Panel, uh, we're done. Thank you.